America has had a long involvement in the Middle East that dates back to the end of World War II. It's been a complicated situation that came about as the result of shifting U.S. foreign policy and geopolitical changes across the globe. The U.S. involvement in the Middle East has included pacts and alliances with countries such as Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Israel. It's also recruited in hostile relationships with other Middle Eastern nations including Iran, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria. The motives for getting entangled in the Middle East have included access to oil, protecting the region from hostile forces, promoting democracy, and keeping terrorism in check. Many Americans have questioned how necessary a U.S. presence really is. Although it may be difficult for America to simply wipe its hands clean of the region and make a prompt exit. Either way, the U.S. began to seriously look at Middle East as a region of strategic importance towards the end of World War II. As the war came to an end, the United States was positioning itself as the new Western superpower. The American population and economy were booming. Previous Western powers such as Britain, France, and Germany were reeling from the devastating toll of war on their doorstep. There was also a growing unease about the very real threat coming from the Soviet Union, and it became crucial for the U.S. to form ties and establish dominance in new areas of the world, such as Asia and the Middle East. Additionally, although America wasn't entirely reliant on Middle Eastern oil reserves, its European allies were, and if the U.S. knew that an enemy was able to dictate terms over oil prices and supplies, it would have dire effects on the world economy. In 1945, America's first real involvement in the Middle East began in Iran. U.S. forces were stationed there to oversee supply flows to the Soviet Union while at the same time protecting Iranian oil fields. It was becoming apparent to America and its allies that access to oil would be vital to fuel its industrialized and increasingly motorized economy. As a result, President Truman kept his troops in Iran at the conclusion of World War II and was quick to form an alliance with the Shah of Iran. He also lobbied hard to get Turkey into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO which sent a clear message to the Soviet Union that the Middle East was to become a fiercely contested region. Initially, Truman had full support at home for his goal of building ties to the Middle East. However, there was a complication. Israel was being spoken about as becoming a new country for Jewish people, and it was to be created from an area of Palestine. In 1947, the United Nations outlaid its partition of Palestine, and it became official in 1948. The land was divided up, with 57% going to Israel and the other 43% remaining as Palestine. This not only fueled deep hostilities within the largely Muslim Arab countries in the Middle East, but also made several Western countries nervous. Uh, you know, they saw it as problematic and a recipe for disaster. Truman, however, was all for the new nation of Israel. He was the first international leader to pack the partition and officially recognize Israel as a nation. America had many thriving Jewish communities, and they had plenty of people were sympathetic to their plight as the Holocaust revolutions came to light. The United States was also keen to establish Middle Eastern alliances, both for geopolitical and economic reasons. An oil trade pact with Saudi Arabia has already been formed in 1933, and Israel and Egypt were being backed as another potential U.S. ally. Despite Truman's backing of Israel, though, many American politicians were very much against it. They were not anxious to rock the boat in the Middle East. To guarantee a regular supply of oil was available. It was agreed upon, though, that the U.S. needed to strengthen alliances in the Middle East as the threat of a Soviet invasion was very real. As the 1950s rolled around, things were about to really heat up for the American involvement in the region. In 1953, President Eisenhower gave the green light for the CIA to depose of the Iranian Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh was an elected leader of the state and vigorously opposed to Western involvement in the Middle East. This led to bitter anti-American feelings in Iran, which persist to this day. So, unbothered by Iran's reaction, the United States was contrarily concerned that if the Soviets decided to move into the Middle East and stamp its authority, the American-led forces might be too thin to combat them. The end of World War II saw Western colonial powers withdraw from the Middle East, leaving many countries open for Soviet engagement. France had pulled out of Syria and Lebanon. Britain withdrew from Palestine and Iraq, and then lost control of Egypt. The Egyptians' surge to independence and control of the Suez Canal was a particularly bitter pill for Britain to swallow. America had been supporting Egypt, as the U.S. saw Egypt as one of the natural leaders in the Middle East and North African region. It was regarded by many as the moment that Britain lost its hold as a true global superpower. America continued to become more and more involved in the Middle East. In 1958, President Eisenhower sent in American troops to protect Iraq's Christian government from nationalist rebels. As the Cold War intensified during the 1960s, America continued to build on its relationship with Israel. 
1962, President Kennedy signed off on supplying Israel with an anti-aircraft missile system. Now, the U.S. was well aware the Soviets were supplying other Middle Eastern countries such as Syria and Egypt with weapons and were supporting a growing number of Middle Eastern nationalist leaders. Throughout much of the 1960s, America was temporarily distracted from the Middle East with the onset of the Vietnam War and the social repercussions back home. However, the Six-Day War in 1967 brought both the U.S. and the Soviet Union into a standoff. Israel made a preemptive attack on Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Soviets threatened to respond on those countries' behalf if Israel didn't agree to cease fire, which drew America in to make sure tensions weren't escalated any further. Even still, the 1970s proved the most testing time yet for the U.S. and the Middle East. The Arab-Israeli war was the result of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan seeking revenge on Israel for losses incurred during the Six-Day War. America maintained its support of Israel and supplied weapons and arms, which only served to anger many Arab nations. This led to the 1973 Arab oil embargo. Arab members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, imposed an oil embargo on the United States as a retaliation for its support to Israel. This embargo left the American economy reeling and policymakers were forced to frantically search for solutions to restore order in the region. Peace deals were eventually agreed upon and the embargo was lifted, but not before it had sent much of the world's economy into a recession. As the 1970s drew to an end, two significant events marked U.S. involvement in the Middle East. First of all, a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel was finally agreed upon. The result was Israel handing back some territory to Egypt, and both countries began to benefit from the big increases in American aid. Then, in April 1979, the U.S.-backed Shah of Iran was overthrown in a revolution, and Iran became an Islamic republic under the rule of fiercely anti-American Ayatollah Khomeini. Nevertheless, Throughout these tumultuous affairs, the U.S. alliance with Saudi Arabia remained reasonably firm. Seriously. The ruling parties of both countries often failed to see eye to eye on matters, however, they were too invested to break away from their alliance. Saudi Arabia had also become incredibly wealthy because of a long-lasting and economically beneficial relationship with the United States. America still wasn't alone in the Middle East, however, and the Soviet forces soon invaded Afghanistan to support Afghanistan's communist government which was under attack by anti-communist rebels. America and Saudi Arabia immediately formed plans to provide whatever military and economic aid that they could to the Afghan rebels. Much of the Muslim world was strongly opposed to the Soviet leftist and atheist ideologies, and America saw it as one of the Cold War's more serious escalations. The war ultimately led to the beginning of the Soviet downfall and saw America deploy more and more troops into the region, and that was in order to maintain stability. When Saddam Hussein evaded Kuwait in 1990, American forces were quick to step in and defend Saudi's interests by repelling Iraqi troops. This was a clear message to Iran, Iraq, and Russia that the U.S. was still a very much a major player in the Middle East and would do whatever it took to maintain the control that it had. All the while, the continued U.S. presence was giving birth to the rise of anti-Western terrorist groups, which came to a head in 2001. Yet, after the 2001 9-11 attacks, America was again inclined to send huge numbers of troops into the Middle East, firstly to Afghanistan and then to Iraq. As we enter the third decade of the 21st century, many Americans are demanding the U.S. cut ties to the Middle East and just pick up and walk away. They argue that there are more pressing concerns in other regions of the world that require America's focus, and yet, you know, it, it wouldn't be that easy to simply withdraw. Russian presence in the region, the ongoing threat from Iran, political instability, and the resurgence of terrorist groups in the Middle East all demand that some U.S. involvement remain. Perhaps the answer is to do so from a distance, providing aid and intelligence when necessary, using force more covertly, and tolerating certain balances of power. Whatever America decides, the Middle East is one of the world's more volatile regions. The United States has a lot on its plate, even if it was a voluntary serving. However, the focus is shifting. For the foreseeable future, though, at least some kind of American presence seems likely to remain. 